going to invite God to be among us in our worship in this song. We're going to tell him all the things that he is to us. Let, uh, let him be to us the things that we call him in this song. Starting with Almighty King. Come thou almighty King, help us thy name to sing, help us to praise, Father all glorious, or all victorious, come and reign over us, ancient of days, come thou incarnate. Gird on thy mighty sword, our prayer attend. Come and thy people bless, and give thy word success. Spirit of holiness, on us descend. O Lord, our God, to thee the highest praises be, and evermore, thy sovereign majesty, may we in glory see, and to eternity love and After this song, we'll join in prayer together. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. I want you more than gold or silver, only you can satisfy. You alone are the real joy giver and the apple of my eye. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. Let's pray together. Holy Father, we again thank you for all the blessings of this life. Lord, we pray that you will be with those who are sick and afflicted, that your healing hand be upon them. Be especially with those that are a number who are uh, sick with COVID, that you would bring them back to the health that they once knew, Lord, and that your healing hand would be on them. And Lord, we pray that you would be with all those who are in Afghanistan and uh, are trying to navigate that increasing situation. Lord, we pray that you would grant them safety and, and that they would seek seek uh you in in their turmoil lord your your hands be on me uh, lord be with us in all that we do thank you for the for sending jesus so we may have a chance at forgiveness of our sins lord uh, we pray that you would be with us as we continue our sermon our service here and that we would uplift you and all that we do it's in jesus holy and precious name we pray amen
I'll be reading Matthew 13, 36 through 43. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man who will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin, and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Before we honor our Redeemer in fellowship and communion, we'll sing of him. I will sing of my Redeemer and his wondrous love to me. On the cruel cross he suffered, from the curse to set me free. Sing, oh, sing of my Redeemer. With his blood he purchased me. On the cross he sealed my pardon. Paid the debt and made me free. I will tell the wondrous story of my lost estate to save. In his boundless love and mercy, he the ransom freely gave. Sing, oh, sing, of my Redeemer. With his blood he purchased me. On the cross he sealed my pardon, paid the debt, and made me free. I will sing of my Redeemer and his heavenly love to me. He from death to life hath brought me, Son of God, with him to be. Sing, O oh, sing of my Redeemer. With his blood he purchased me. On the cross he sealed my pardon, paid the debt, and made me free. I think I have everything. I was looking for some words to help us to reflect and remember Christ, and I went to house to house, heart to heart, which some of you may be familiar with. I kind of took an article they had and hopefully made it so it will help us to remember Christ this morning. From the book of John, the Word was made flesh. However, it is not his birth, but his death that provides hope. It is his death that unleashed the power of heaven to save men from their sins. 
It is Calvary, not Bethlehem, to which the eyes of lost humanity must turn for hope. It is Calvary where Jesus paid the price for the sins of humanity. It is Calvary where Jesus fulfilled God's law, satisfied divine wrath, and opened the fountain of life from whence has poured forth the cleansing blood of our Lord for 20 centuries. In the book of Galatians, far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. The Lord's Supper is to be observed in spirit and in truth, decently and in order, in remembrance of Christ, in anticipation of Christ's return on the first day of each week. Upon self-examination, it is observed to proclaim Christ as the Savior of men. Give thanks for prayer. Father, we humble ourselves and come before you. Please help us to remember your Son at this time that we do so and we push all the other things in our minds out for the next few moments and we reflect on all the things that Jesus Christ did for us and what he did for the world. Help us to take of this bread which represents his body in a way which pleases you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. for the fruit of the vine. Father, we return to you in prayer. We're so thankful for all the blessings, especially thankful at this time for your son. Help us to drink this fruit of the vine and remember your son and do so throughout the week. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Take time to give thanks for the offering. We have a plate out back. Feel free to drop a check in. You can mail a check or give online. Dear Father in heaven, we are we are blessed by you. We are thankful for the spiritual blessings, and we are thankful for the blessings of this world we have. Please help us when we give to give a cheerful heart. Please help those funds be used in the best manner for the work of the church. Again, we are, we are thankful for your blessings each and every day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's all please be standing as our um, young people are dismissing to Children's Church and Knowledge Seekers for the ages um, posted on the slide. And um, we're going to be singing a song that we all know well. We're going to sing the, just the first and last verses of this song before the message is brought to us this hour. We're going to lower that. Excuse me. 
There is beyond the azure blue a God concealed from human sight. He tinted skies with heavenly hue and friend the world with his great might. There is a God, he is alive, in him we live and we survive. From dust our God created man, he is our God, the great I am. Our God, whose son upon a tree, a life was willing there to give, that he from sin might set man free, and evermore with him could live. There is a God, he is alive, in him we live and we survive. From dust our God created man. He is our God, the great I am. Please be seated. Good morning. <coughs> So, occasionally, whenever I am preparing a lesson, I will come across something which piques my interest, and it might not have anything to do with the lesson specifically, but I end up reading and researching, and I just go down this rabbit trail uh, of figuring all, all this stuff out and, and just looking into some really cool stuff, and then it has nothing to do with the lesson whatsoever. And so this morning... I'm going to piggyback on what we talked about last week because this is one of those situations where I did a whole bunch of research and it never made it into last week's sermon. Today, we'll talk about that stuff. Last week, we talked about the weird story where Moses was on his way to Egypt and then he is suddenly confronted by God and it says that God sought to put him to death. And the result is that Moses' wife, Zipporah, circumcises their son, thereby saving Moses' life. And one of the things we talked about in that lesson is how Zipporah was not an Israelite. Her people did not have the custom or tradition of circumcision. So she might have had a different viewpoint on that practice. Well, who is she? And where did she come from? When Moses meets her, they are in Midian. And it says that her father is a priest of Midian. Her father is going to show up again later when they're wandering in the desert. It is her father that is going to suggest to Moses that he set up a judiciary system in Exodus 18. He even brings a burnt offering. And verse 12 says, And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and sacrifices to God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. Jethro is quite favorable to the Israelites. And Jethro praises God for all that God has done for these people. And they in turn treat him very well. Later on, in the book of Judges, uh, we find out more about him. He's not just a Midianite. He's actually what's called a Kenite. In Judges 1 and verse 16, then the descendants of the Kenite, Moses' father-in-law, went up with the people of Judah from the city of Palms into the wilderness of Judah, which lies in the Negev near Arad, and they went and settled with the people. And so here we have the Kenites, who were descendants of Moses' father-in-law, who are now incorporating themselves into the tribe of Judah. And throughout the Bible, the Kenites are talked about very favorably. They are allies of Israel, and then part of them actually become associated with Israel, specifically Judah. Not all of them. There are some other branches of the Kenites who stay out on their own and they don't become directly associated with the Israelites, but they are still, for the most part, respected and thought of very highly. But who are they 
and where did they come from? If we go all the way back to Genesis 15, when God is making the covenant and making his promises to Abraham, verses 18 through 21 says, On the day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying to your offspring I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites. The Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. So the Canaanites, they are already in the land when God promises he's going to give it to Abraham. Now some people have tried to say that the Midianites and the Kenites are basically the same group of people. We know that Jethro is a priest of Midian, but he's also called a Kenite. Some have tried to say two names for the same group of people. The problem is that that doesn't really work because the Midianites are descendants of Midian. Midian was born to Abraham by his other wife, Keturah. We find this in Genesis 25 too. So it seems very unlikely that God is telling Abraham, your descendants are going to possess this land and then he lists off who's already in the land, and by the way, your descendants are already there, Kenites. It doesn't really work that way. So it seems that the Kenites and the Midianites are two different groups of people, and the Kenites existed long before the Midianites ever even became a nation. But it still begs the question, who are they? Where'd they come from? Here's where things start to get interesting. And this is why my interest was piqued and I started going down the rabbit trail. Throughout the Bible, they are mentioned positively. They are good people who help the Israelites. They like the Israelites. They have good relations with the Israelites. They even become associated with the Israelites. But if you go on the internet and start researching their origins, you might thing, find some things that are not so positive. Quite the opposite. And we'll get to that in just a second. But first, what scholars and sociologists know about the Kenites are that they were a group of people who were very skilled in metalworking. In fact, this may be where they got their name from the Semitic root word Cain, meaning tinsmith or craftsman. It is believed that they were very advanced in the arts and sciences, even more so than the Israelites. In fact, it's believed that the Kenites were the ones to teach the Israelites a lot and help them become a more advanced culture than what they originally were. It was also considered a grave crime to ever harm a Kenite. These people held almost a sacred status, and whether you loved them or hated them, you don't mess with them. Don't touch them. Don't harm them. It doesn't matter what nation you're from or who else you have beef with. Leave the Kenites out of it. They're off limits. Don't mess with them. And interestingly, according to the Jewish Virtual Library, quote, among primitive tribes to the present day, there are clans of coppersmiths and tinsmiths whom it is considered a grave offense to harm. Okay. All that being said, who else do we know of that was a metal worker that you were not allowed to harm? We go all the way back to Genesis 4. This is where we have the story of Cain and Abel. And after that, we have a list of the descendants of Cain. Verse 22, Zillah also bore Tubal Cain. He was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. This is the first mention of people working with metal. If we back it up before we're given the lineage of Cain, all the way back to 13 through 16, Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. There are people who believe the Kenites 
are descendants of Cain. Specifically, from the line of Tubal Cain. And in fact, there are many who believe they get their very name, Kenites, from Cain. They are the ones you do not harm, you do not mess with. They have been marked to be left alone, and they are continuing on in their ancestors' footsteps of working with metals. Now, there are some problems with this. You may already be thinking in your head, whoa, wait a minute. How can that even be? There was a flood. The flood wiped everyone out. And even if there was someone on Noah's Ark, which did come from the lineage of Cain, like let's just say, for instance, Ham's wife happened to be a descendant of Cain, kids still aren't directly just in the lineage of Cain, nor would they be continuing on as a clan, as a tribe of people who are carrying on their ancestral traditions. Something's not adding up. And to that, I would say, exactly. <laughs> Something's not adding up. There's a huge flaw with this theory. Frankly, it does not work, and there are just too many holes in it. However, that has not stopped some people from running with this theory and promoting some false doctrine. This is where my interest was really piqued as I was as I was researching the Kenites, because I am not a conspiracy theorist, but I do love me a good conspiracy theory. <laughs> there is a church called Shepherd's Chapel in Gravit, Arkansas, and they broadcast their services on over 150 local television stations. And they have been teaching two false doctrines. Well, actually, they teach a lot of false doctrines. Two specifically, as it relates to this uh, topic. And they are pushing these false doctrines, and they are getting it out into the public. The first doctrine is the doctrine of Satan's seed. The second is called the Kenite hypothesis. And these two go hand in hand. <coughs> Excuse me. So what these two doctrines teach is that Cain is not Adam's son. Eve was impregnated by Satan himself. Cain is a descendant of Satan, and that explains why Cain murdered his brother Abel. And they teach that Jesus himself confirms the fact that Cain is Satan's son by quoting from Matthew 13. In Matthew 13, Jesus is telling a bunch of parables but he also explains some of those parables to his apostles. And so in verses 37 through 39, he's explaining the parable of the weeds that grew up alongside the good harvest. He answered, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. Harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. So there you go. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. Based on that, they claim that Satan has actual, physical sons. And they are the lineage of Cain. Now, I'm hoping everyone here can see the problem with this interpretation and why that's not correct. Because what they're doing by interpreting it this way is taking the word seed and using it as actual physical sperm meat egg to grow a child. And if that's how you're going to use it, I would like them to explain verse 37. The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The Son of Man is Jesus. So who exactly today are Jesus' physical children? Where is the lineage of Jesus? They don't talk about that one. We're going to ignore that part. That part, where he's explaining the parable, well, that's just talking about the gospel being deceived, people responding to the good news of Christ. But this last part, that's talking about actual physical Satan seed can see the problem with this. Gee, I wonder if there's any way to know exactly who Cain 
is the son of? I don't know. Maybe Genesis 4.1. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. I'm sure you're all aware the word new is a Hebrew euphemism for having sex. Adam. Adam had sex with Eve, his wife. The result is she conceived and bore Cain. I think that much is pretty clear. But they continue to promote this idea of Satan's seed. Okay, well, even so, even if that was the case, even running with what they're promoting, there's still a flood that wiped everyone out, and now that race is gone. Ah, but no. They teach that the Kenites, or sons of Cain, survived the flood. They made it through. And after they made it through the flood, they waited. And all the stuff we read about in the Bible takes place, and they're waiting. God makes a covenant with Abraham. The Kenites are waiting. Joseph goes to Egypt. The Kenites are waiting. The Israelites become a numerous nation, but they're put into slavery. And the Kenites are waiting. And then comes the call of Moses. And Moses is going to go and, and bring them out of slavery. And it just so happens. Who did Moses marry into? Kenites. And the Kenites are thought of as great people. They help the Israelites out. They make friends with them. And by the time we come to Judges, the Kenites even settle into the tribe of Judah. They become a part of them. And the whole thing is a deception. This was Satan's plan from the beginning. To have his own race infiltrating into God's people in order to cause destruction. Why did the Israelites stop following God and start worshiping idols? Oh, that was the Kenites. Quietly working behind the scenes. Why did the Israelites go into captivity? Oh, that was the Kenites. Quietly working behind the scenes. Kenites are Satan's seed wreaking havoc with God's plan. And according to Shepherd's Chapel, the Kenites are still here with us to this very day. And I listened to some sermons where the preacher was explaining that when the temple was destroyed, the Jews lost their records of genealogy. They no longer know who comes from what tribe, and all of that's true. To this day, the Jewish people cannot point to which tribe they are a member of or where they came from. That has been lost to history. Isn't that just the way the Kenites want it? So that no one can distinguish between a true Israelite and a Kenite. And to this day, they say the sons of Satan are still having influence in our government, in our culture. Is it any wonder that our society is as messed up as it is because there are millions of Satan's actual physical kids from the lineage of Cain walking among us? and leading us away from Christ. Great story. Too bad it doesn't even come close to holding water. There are so many holes in the doctrine of Satan's seed and the Kenite hypothesis. There are so many problems with this, and so much of it can be refuted. It's unbelievable. They're still teaching it, and they're still broadcasting it to a lot of people. Who are the actual Kenites? We don't know exactly where they came from, the same as we don't know where a lot of nations and tribes originated. But what we do know is that the Bible speaks of them very favorably. The Bible mentions the Kenites. There are many interactions with them, and the Bible always puts them in a positive light. The only way they become bad people is when you go down the weird rabbit hole of Bible conspiracy theories and start twisting Scripture around to make it say what you want it to say. The reality is, Satan's seed is everywhere around us. But it's not the Kenites. The seed of Satan are the lies that would cause a person to deny the gospel. It's denying Christ. It's working against him. It's false doctrine. It's false teaching that would lead a person away from the truth of God. Paul says in Ephesians 6 verse 12, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, 
but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. It's not a person. It's not a group of people. It's not the Kenites. It's the evil that is around us in the world trying to pull us away from Christ. And so what are we supposed to do about that? Paul continues on. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit is the word of God. If that's what you need to do this morning, we offer you the invitation. It's an invitation to come to Christ. And if that's in baptism, we are ready to help you with that. If it's something else, we're ready to help you with that. If you need prayers, if you need change, if you need someone to lean on, if you need help, this invitation is for you. Please come while we stand and sing. Into the heart of Jesus, deeper and deeper I go, seeking to know the reason why he should love me so, why he should stoop to lift me up from the miry clay, saving my soul, making me whole, though I had wandered away. Into the will of Jesus, deeper and deeper I go. Praying for grace to follow, seeking his way to know, bowing in full surrender, low at his blessed feet, bidding him take, break me and make, till I am molded and me. Into the cross of Jesus, Deeper and deeper I go, following through the garden, facing the dreaded foe, drinking the cup of sorrow, sobbing with broken heart. Oh, Savior, help, dear Savior, help, grace for my weakness into the joy of Jesus, deeper and deeper I go, rising with soul and rapture, far from the world below, joy in the place of sorrow, peace in the midst of pain, Jesus will give, Jesus will give, he will uphold and sustain. Please remain standing while we're going to be led in a prayer. Father, Lord, we do thank you uh, for this time that we've had with you. Father, as we leave this place, uh, we pray that you would help us to remember who we are, who we represent. Help us to um, be mindful of the things that we say, things that we think, and things that we do. Father, we know we're going to fail, but we thank you for loving us the way that you do. And Father, we pray for your continued forgiveness, your continued safety and protection, and uh, we just ask you to be with us in the decisions that we make and the words that we speak. But most of all, Father, we thank you for your son. It's truly in his name. Amen.